While I was here, many of you know me that I, uh, I worked for an audiovisual company. And whenever I worked for them, um, I worked for a gentleman who was very, very smart. In fact, he had uh, a lot of education and everything. If somebody bring me a tissue, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, worked for this gentleman, uh, Alan Pearson, uh, just very smart. The man knew a lot about physics, knew a lot about electronics and everything. And sometimes he knew so much, it kind of got in the way of his common sense, I think. Because I would just go up to him sometimes and say, Boss, how do I turn this thing up? I just want to turn up, make it a little bit louder. Thank you, brother. Just make it a little bit louder. And he'd say, well, Troy, that's easy. All you got to do is apply a little bit of voltage to the potentiometer, and that will increase the transistor, the, the uh, resistance to the transducer, which will ultimately produce sine waves, uh, higher decibels of the perceived volume. Okay, could you tell me that in English, please? Okay, just turn up this knob right here, and that'll make it louder. Sometimes you just have to say things a little bit more simple, do we not? Sometimes you can say things in a complicated manner, and it might be true, but it doesn't help us to understand. Brethren, do you realize that our Lord was like that? He spoke in that way. Jesus Christ, when He was on this earth, had infinite knowledge. The world was created through Him. And He could answer any question at any time about anything, and yet He chose to spoke to us, spoke, speak to us. In parables, I've heard it often said that a parable is an explanation of heavenly concepts using earthly objects. And that's indeed true. Jesus spoke to us in this manner. In fact, when we think about the various ways that Jesus spoke to us, something as complicated as, as taking the gospel to the entire world was simplified by simply saying the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. A simple way to understand a concept that's a little bit difficult to wrap your brain around if you think about it. And so we see throughout all the scriptures that Jesus talks in this way. The apostles talk in this way. Paul, when he wrote, he would use these ideas, these termino this terminology of planting and seeds and watering and growing so that we might understand exactly what the Bible is trying to teach us in these spiritual concepts, in these heavenly concepts. And so that's why I would like this morning to look at one of these as the scripture that was read this morning in Matthew 13. If you have your Bible, please open with me to Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9, and 19 and forward. I would like to look at a parable of Jesus Christ and the way that he spoke to us that even today we can identify with and understand exactly what it is that he's saying. In Matthew 13, verse 3 through 9, we're going to see that the emphasis is on the harvest. And he says, Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places, where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Some seed fell among thorns. The thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop. Some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's not difficult to understand what Jesus is saying here. And just in case there is a soul out there who doesn't understand what Jesus is trying to teach us, we are blessed to have the explanation in verses 18 and forward where he explains exactly what he means, exactly what it is he's trying to say to us. And that's what I'd like to look at this morning, is the, this concept that Jesus Christ gives us in the seed, the sower, and the soils. An incredible parable that helps us to understand a heavenly concept. First of all, we see the seed, the incredible seed created by God himself. The incredible seed that has this life within itself. Genesis 1.11 tells us that. It says that God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb whose seed is in itself and fruit trees yielding after its own kind whose seed is within itself. This seed has life within itself. I talked to a brother who's a biologist who says, They know how it happens. They can observe what happens, but they don't know why. 
it happens. Millions, according to the evolutionist, millions of years later, they still don't know how this happens. Isn't that interesting? We haven't evolved in our smarts, have we? And so it's interesting, this seed that even in its smallest, smallest, tiniest form can grow to be a tree, as we see a little bit further along in this same chapter, in the mustard seed. This little seed and it, 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 what it can do, we realize then that the abundance of the crop, the harvest that we're talking about here, comes from this seed. That's the one thing that we do know. And according to verse 19 in Matthew 13 here, we have the explanation that the seed is the word of God. Now this makes perfect sense when you think about that. This seed that according to the parable we need to be sowing. We need to be out there spreading. Makes perfect sense. Whenever you hear Paul say things like, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And then also when we think about Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and powerful. John 6 verse 63, when Jesus says, My words are spirit and a spirit that gives life. So just like a seed has life within itself, so does the word of God. The word of God gives us life. And as it says in this parable, we're talking about a harvest. Now, sadly, we can have crop failure due to the seed. If we don't take care of the seed, it is susceptible to heat and to moisture, to insects and things like that can destroy that seed and cause crop failure. But you know what's incredible? If you guard that seed and take care of it, it will last years, thousands of years. In fact, there was a seed, a date palm that they found in a jar in Jericho over 2,000 years old and some scientists took one of those seeds and planted it, and here you see the result of a date palm from a seed more than 2,000 years old. I love the name of that, Methuselah. And I wonder if that guy got in trouble for planting that seed, because now they don't have the archaeological evidence anymore. But how incredible is that, that the power that is within the seed. It's possible to damage a seed, brethren, but it is impossible to damage the Word of God. Because... 1 Peter 1.23 tells us the word of God which lives and abides forever. But like the seed, if we don't guard it, if we don't take care of it, if it's not completely presented, if it can be corrupted some way or another, then you're not going to have a good harvest. The seed is that first essential component to having a good harvest. Now the second component is also important, and that is the sower. The seed can't really do anything in and of itself. It has to have a transportation from its point of origin to its destination. I realize sometimes this happens by just falling off the tree or the wind blowing out. But to have an abundant crop, to have an abundant harvest, one must go out and spread the seed all around. And even though we might have modern technology like this, the process is still the same. It hasn't changed since the dawn of time. And that is that you have to put that seed in the ground at a certain depth, at a certain distance, in order to get... An abundant harvest. And even with the machine, it can spread to all the different types of soils that the Lord teaches us about. And it's interesting, this sower, that what's involved, that Jesus doesn't really talk a lot about the sower. He just says, a sower went out and see. So he doesn't spend a lot of time there. So we need to understand, it is actually possible to have crop failure because of the sower. If the sower doesn't do his job well, if the sower doesn't get out of the house and go out and sow, if the sower doesn't do what he's supposed to do, then he's not going to have a good crop. And sadly, a lot of times, the sower turns into a soil analyzer. Spends more time analyzing that soil instead of getting out there and sow. But what does the Great Commission say? Does it say go out and analyze the soil? It says go and sow. And so that's what the job is of a sower. So often, though, we get wrapped up in analyzing that soil that we waste our time instead of doing what the Lord has asked us to do, and that is to go out and sow. And so to to go out and sow the word and and to do, it makes perfect sense whenever you read, again, the words of Paul in Romans, verse 10, when it says in verse 13, excuse me, in Romans chapter 10, verse 13, For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And then shall, how shall they call upon him whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring the good tidings of good things. Or 2 Corinthians 9 verse 6, a simple concept. He who, ropes, he who reaps, ah, he who sows abundantly shall reap abundantly. He who sows sparingly shall reap sparingly. These are not difficult concepts to understand using these earthly objects, earthly things to help us understand these heavenly concepts. Now obviously these first two points are very important. But the emphasis is on the harvest. The emphasis is on the soils. And so let's just go ahead and assume that we have the good seed and we have a faithful sower. And so the focus is on the four soils. The different soils that Jesus Christ shows us. And it shows in us it's spread across all types of soils. And this makes perfect sense and perfect harmony with the Bible as well. When we read Titus 2.11 that says the grace of God that brings salvation has, has appeared to all men. Or 1 Timothy 2.4 and where God says that He desires all men to repent and come to the knowledge of truth. And so we're talking about the reality is the problem is not necessarily with the seed and not necessarily with the sower, but most likely with the soil. That attitude of the heart and how it receives the seed that is being sowed. And so we look at the various ones and the first one we see is that some seed fell by the wayside. You know, this isn't difficult to imagine, especially if you live in Paraguay. We have some really hard roads down there. We have these things called empathrados or these rock roads that are deep. These big rocks that make up all these roads. And let me tell you, if a seed falls on there, I'll tell you what's going to happen. Exactly what Jesus says in the explanation. The birds come and they snatch that seed away. Jesus says this is Satan who comes and takes that seed right away. We have the explanation in Matthew 13. Have, do you know anybody like that? Have you ever seen that happen? Where people don't want to hear what you have to say? Where people are more involved in their lives that they really are indifferent or and sometimes they're actually antagonistic towards God, towards the Word of God. Has that ever happened? Well, brethren, if it has, I'd like for you to think about the example that we have in Acts chapter, in Acts chapter 24, verse 25, in Acts chapter 26, 24, and 28, when the Apostle Paul was sowing seed to, you remember the story of Felix? And Festus and Agrippa, what happened? He was sowing that seed, and that seed landed on hard, firm ground. Paul, come back at a more convenient time. I'll call you at a more convenient time. Paul, all this learning that you've done has made you mad. Paul, you think you're going to turn me into a Christian with just a little speech here? That seed landed on hard ground. But what is the point? The point is, Paul sowed the same. He did not say analyze the soil or anything else. He sowed that seed. So whenever you get discouraged about somebody not wanting to hear uh, the Word of God, not wanting to hear what you have to say in regards to the Bible, just realize there are different soils, and that's going to happen sometimes. It says that some seed fell on stony ground. I'll tell you, Paraguay also has some really stony places. They have these rock formations in the north part of the country. They're some of the most beautiful in the world. And that entire area is just rocky and stony. I don't see how anything hardly can grow there. And that makes perfect sense when we think about that. When you have a field and there are lots of stones, lots of, uh, 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 of obstructions, well, the seed can't get down into the soil. In this case, it is what the soil is lacking. Not enough depth. Jesus says in his explanation that this is those who receive the word gladly with joy immediately, but because it has no root, it does not last long. When trouble and persecution arise, they leave the church. Do you know somebody like that? I can't tell you how many times, just in the short time we've been in Paraguay, I've seen somebody accept the gospel and I've seen somebody joyfully uh, uh, listen to it and, and accept it and then just a short time later fall away. Have you ever seen that here at Palm Beach Lakes? Brethren, when we think about that, we shouldn't be surprised because, again, 
We have the parable, but then we also have an example that in Galatians, in Galatians 1, verse 6, when Paul says, I marvel that you so soon removed from him that called you the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Or the sad example of our brother Demas, who abandoned Paul because he loved this present world. Whenever persecution or problems arose, they left the church. They left the Lord. And here is a good reason why it's so important to study your Bibles. Here is a good reason why it's so important to, to, to work hard so that you can deepen those roots. You can't deepen roots in a rocky field without much effort. You have to work at it. And so there is that possibility that still we sow the same and that seed will take root. After this, it says that some fell on thorny ground. Again, I'm reminded of, of the things that I see in Paraguay. We have some really thorny plants in Paraguay. In fact, we have this, this tree called the Palo Borracho tree. It means the drunk tree. And I feel sorry for kids that live in this area because they don't get to climb trees. Who would want to climb a tree with those savage thorns on there like that? We have lots of, of plants like that, including the crown of thorns. The crown of thorns that is so... <laughs> a lot of people use to protect their homes with. Jesus says that in verse 22 of chapter 13, that this is the one who received the seed, and the one that received the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, choke it so it does not come to fruition. The individual had received the word, but there was too much competition. It choked it out. And so the only way that the Word's going to have an opportunity to grow is by removing those obstacles, by cutting away the barriers there. Again, do you know anybody like that? This describes most of America, does it not? We have so many concerns and cares, so many things that are competing for our attention, and so many different things that are happening in our lives that easily the Word of God can be choked out because we just don't have enough time to read our Bibles. Do you know the Paraguayans have the same problem that you do? In fact, I like this street corner. I like to call it the Times Square of, of Paraguay. Because you just see this and it's competing for your time, competing for your money, competing for everything. And they have the same problems that we do right here in America. Where the concerns about pornography, the concerns and, and, and the addictions to drug and alcohol, to power, to money and things like that. Brethren, it's, people are the same all over the world according to the Bible. They're all going to stand before the judgment seat of God one day. And they're going to have to give an account. And so they have the same concerns. They have the same problems that you and I do in regards to, to having the word be choked out. All of these, brethren, have to do with crop failure. Each and every one of these has to do with a failure in producing a harvest. And I don't know a single farmer anywhere on the earth that, that wakes up one morning and goes, woohoo, can't wait to have a crop failure today. <laughs> no right thinking person thinks that way. We, every person who sows, every person who puts in an effort, every farmer wants to have an abundant crop. And so how do you get that? By sowing abundantly. And so if we do that, then it will fall on good ground. It says in the parable, some seed fell upon good ground. Verse 22 in, in Matthew 13 says, But he who received the seed on the good ground is he who hears the word and understands it. Indeed, bears fruit and produces some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Brethren, when we read John chapter 15, verse 8, we see that producing fruit is what glorifies God. That's what we must do. That's what we should expect when the seed is sowed, it is received and understood that that person will grow and produce fruit. Every farmer wants to have an abundant crop. Every farmer wants to produce fruit, but he must also realize that he's just a sower and he just sowed the seed. It is God who gives the increase. God is the one who gives the increase and our job is to plant. Our job is simply to, to go out and sow. And as one of the soils, we need to produce fruit. It's not a difficult concept to understand. When I think about the, the rich soil of Paraguay, you see this picture here. I know a lot of you might be thinking maybe that's Alabama or Oklahoma or something like that. But that's Paraguay. 
And Paraguay has a very rich soil, highly sought after, has some of the best soybean crops in all the world. You know, but Paraguay doesn't have just a rich physical soil. It has a very rich spiritual soil. For example, just looking at a picture, I can look at this picture and see all kinds of things within our brethren there in Paraguay. This picture was taken in 2011. There are 64 souls in this picture. Let's just say soils. And out of those 64 soils, eight of them were visitors. One of them has since been baptized. Three of them still continue to come and worship with us and study with us. But five of those have been withdrawn from, two of which have been restored. You see the different soils and what's happening there? Let's move forward a couple of years. And we have 20 soils, excuse me, 83 soils with 20 visitors. Out of those 20 visitors, seven of those are baptized, which you saw this morning in the presentation, and seven more continue to visit with us. And I realize you don't really know these people here, some of these people, but I can look at this picture, and I'm sure you have a picture just like this that's sad because you can identify all four soils. Sad because of the three soils, the three crop failures that you can see in pictures like this. But what about that rich, fertile soil we have in our children? These are the children of our faithful members. There's fertile soil right there. In fact, there's fertile soil all over the world. What about the fertile soil right here in America? America's been known for its soil, its crop producing capabilities. But what about its spiritual soil? We have that opportunity to sow and to, to go out and to abundantly sow the seed of God. You know, this that we're talking about is, is, is not too difficult to understand. That's why this parable that uses earthly things to explain heavenly concepts helps us to understand these things. We can identify with these things just like people 2,000 years ago in the days of Jesus Christ. They understood completely what he was saying by the things that he was using. And we need to understand that this, the point of all this is that the very... This naturally implies a choice. We're talking about choices. And when we see these choices, a decision that needs to be made, it depends upon the soil in which the seed lands. The various types of soils that are out there, for example, the example the, what we see in Acts. Whenever Peter was preaching to the Jews in Acts chapter 2, it says that they were pricked in the heart. And then those same Jews, some of those Jews, when Stephen was preaching to them in Acts chapter 7, says they were cut to the heart. Brethren, it was the same message. And yet two different reactions. Just like the sun, the S-U-N sun, can have two different reactions. It can either melt butter or it can harden cement. It's the same sun. The same message can have a different reaction depending on where it lands and what type of fertile soil it lands upon. So we need to think about the words of Jesus and examining what has been said in this parable. We need to think about what our responsibility is. And the question comes to us, how is my heart? Is it hard? Is it obstructed? Is it fertile? Am I producing fruit? And I hope you'll realize that all of this has to do with salvation. All this has to do with that gospel message of hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, and then repenting. Stop doing those things that are contrary to God's will and start doing those things that are pleasing to Him according to His Word. Confessing that Jesus Christ is indeed the Son of God and then being baptized to have those sins washed away, arising in newness of life like a newborn babe, and then living faithfully until death. That's that message that's that seed that we need to be sowing. That's that hope that we're given. And I pray that if indeed you have had that seed land in your heart, and if it has indeed choked out the Word or choked out uh, your love for God, that you'll make that right this morning. You have the opportunity to come forward and ask the church to pray for you. We read 1 John 1, 7. It says that if we confess our sins, He is willing to forgive us. So we have that opportunity to constantly be cleansed in His blood. 
Or perhaps this is the first time that you've heard the gospel message or you've been thinking about this gospel message and the seed is finally starting to take root within your heart. And you realize the only way I'm going to have everlasting life, the only way I'm going to be pleasing to God is by allowing that seed to germinate and grow and to produce fruit. And that first step is by obeying that gospel call. If you're subject to that gospel call, again, you have the opportunity this morning to come forward and and have the elders pray for you and then accept that gospel call and be baptized right here. We have a baptistry ready, willing and waiting for you to obey that gospel call and start your day in newness of life. If we can help you anyway, we pray and ask that you come right now. As together we stand and sing. Will you come?